Thank you so much, Crystal. She's been like an amazing organizer. So thank you so much. Thank you, Crystal. <laughs> also, these mics are amazing. <laughs> I feel like Britney Spears. I know. It's like Madonna. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was at the Pink concert last night in New York, so I'm like channeling that moment. <laughs> Just give me a tightrope. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell this is going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Jana Rich, uh, founder and CEO of an organization called Rich Talent Group, where we help to build high growth consumer tech businesses. We're both here in San Francisco and in, and in New York. And I think one of the many reasons why Alexa and I have connected, I'm going to introduce her in a moment, is because we've both been deeply committed to supporting women and women entrepreneurs. And it's very fun to be able to share this. We've never done this together before, but we are both founders. We've had a chance to work with Alexa. She was building her team at LearnVest and are now partnering with her as well at Inspired Capital. So this is going to be fun for us to do this together. If you guys ever need to hire anybody, she's your first <laughs> phone call for sure. <laughs> Thank you. A uh, little bit about Alexa. So some of you may have read up about her background, but in 2008, being really inspired about women and their financial health, she founded a company by the name of LearnVest that was wildly successful, was sold to Northwestern Mutual, where Alexa became their chief innovation officer. So really helping a very large legacy business figure out how digital tools could enable the future. She, as you know tonight, she's the author of a new book which we're going to dig in and talk about called Financially Forward. She, this is her second book. In tw 2013, she had her first book, Financially Fearless, which was a New York Times bestseller. Lastly, she also now just launched a weekly podcast in her spare time with Inc. Magazine called Founders Project. So please join me in welcoming Alexa Von Dobel. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> The first question is really around mission. So way back in 2008, when you first got involved, what inspired you to get involved in this whole world of financial planning? Um, so first, it's so fun to have it be 2019 and we're sitting here and fintech is a thing and billions of dollars uh, is pouring into this entire industry of how do we make you know our wallets easier. Uh, but for me, it was a really simple story. I graduated from Harvard undergrad, got my first job on Wall Street. And there I was being like, Okay, I have a job. Woohoo, that was like a check mark. Um, <laughs> I was, you know, good at math, really good at uh, just kind of understanding the markets and the financial world. Um, but I remember just having this really clear moment where I was like, I have no idea how many credit cards I should have, what I can afford in my budget for my rent. Um, and I can't believe that I actually have never learned a single thing about personal finance. I know nothing about retirement 401k versus IRA. And I just had a really like simple moment where I said, here I am. Uh, I have no responsibilities and like ultimately no financial stress because nobody's relying on me, but I'm so stressed and I don't know what I should be doing. And I was just like, what is the rest of the country doing? Um, and then I realized I like no money. I was young. I was like, you know, 22. I was like, nobody wants to talk to me about my money because I don't have any. Um, so it's, I, and I remember just, it was so simple. I was like, well, if I don't have any money, no one will help me not make mistakes. How do I ever get to a place where I actually have enough money to not worry about it? Um, so really simple idea. Learn Best was born and Learn Best stood for learn, earn, invest. The three pillars of money. You have to learn about it. You have to earn it. And then you have to invest it. Um, and in the end, we ended up building TurboTax for financial planning uh, software um, that could give any American family a financial plan uh, for a really affordable price. And it was just... At the time, I didn't know how disruptive it was, um, but it was so disruptive. And actually, Schwab last week just launched subscription-based financial planning, um, and I just was building what like exactly and precisely I wish existed for me, uh, which I believe is always a good way for a founder to go out and build something. And tell us just a little bit about the journey of LearnVest. So <laughs> it went through major growth as an independent company, and then I'm sure a seismic shift when you became part of Northwestern Mutual. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? Yeah. Um, so first, I went back to um, Harvard Business School in the fall of 2008. Um, and then on December 18th of 2008, like actually at the bottom of the market in 81 years, the worst recession is right when I dropped out of HBS. So I remember uh, being like, mom, are you sitting down? Um, I have a big idea. I'm going to go build a company. Um, as like the markets were like, and I was like, don't look at the TVs today because this is a great idea, I promise. Um, but no, I mean, it was terrifying. So I literally just, I'll start with that, which was um, 
you know, taking the jump to go be an entrepreneur was super scary for me um, because the path isn't clear. It may be clearer today because I think there's actually a lot more of an ecosystem around entrepreneurship. Um, but, you know, I moved to New York City where I was a sole founder, had nobody committing a dollar to my startup. It wasn't like I had like millions of dollars falling out of the sky. It was like literally me and like my laptop on my boyfriend's couch. He's not my husband. <laughs> um, and just trying to figure out how do I go and raise seed money. And um, it's a really fun story to tell now, but at the night of our wedding, my husband literally stood up and gave this speech um, because at that point, Lauren Best had raised a lot of money and it had seemed like a success. And um, he told the story of those first six months when I dropped out. So basically the beginning of 2009 through June, when he was just like every day he would walk home and there'd be me sitting in front of a laptop with like tears sometimes streaming down my face. You know, the weird crying where you're crying, but you're still doing something. Because um, you have to keep moving. Because you just like can't stop. Yeah. Um, and he would tell the story of just how people would say no and I had to just keep going and keep figuring it out. And I was trying to build a financial planning platform. Um, but again, the startup ecosystem in New York was still so underdeveloped compared to um, even the Valley today. Um, and just one day I met my people who were like, I believe in this idea. It's a big one. I want to get behind you. And then miraculously, two of my classmates from HBS applied to come work at my company, which was literally me and a couch. Um, and Annie, who's in this room, yes. was literally at Princeton. And I welcomed her into our internship program, which, which was me and a couch <laughs> and a laptop. I convinced her, her dad. I was like, it's okay. It's going to be great. Um, let her come. Um, and Annie, of course, like saved the email where she was like, Alexa, you literally like told me that I had to wear suits. <laughs> I was like, our dress code is formal. Um, she was like, who are you? Um, but I you lied to yeah, yeah, I was, I, I was trying to put on a good show for our company. Um, and then just the next thing we knew, we had a team and progress and users. And then we were TechCrunch 50 company. And the next thing we knew, we had 10,000 users and money coming in and, you know, progress begets progress. And so, yeah. So um, just the punchline was true. Like it was hard and it was, you know, in the bottom of the recession, starting something I really believed in. Um, and I do just believe that that's that is the grit that entrepreneurship makes entrepreneurship beautiful, but also is so hard. And those stories now are so romantic, but I lived them and I have the wrinkles to prove it. So what would be a couple of things, especially when you, you know, you hit those moments where it's not completely clear, but now looking back through the rearview mirror, what were a couple of the reasons do you think that LearnVest was so successful? Uh, I, one, I think we had a really big mission, which is we just believed every person in America, if you can give them access to a financial plan, you can really change their life. And, um, you know, I won't, I avoid getting into politics, but I think one of the things that's so destabilizing for the country right now is people are trying to figure out how do you have dignity if your family can't pay its bills and 78% of the country lives paycheck to paycheck. So huge mission. Um, the last question, every time we hired somebody would be just tell us the time in your own family where money was worrisome. And guess what? There wasn't one person I interviewed that didn't just either tear up or open up into right now, so-and-so is struggling or this, or literally our own employees who are on food stamps. And it just, money is this place of really odd vulnerability and shame. And so um, it was a mission we could really get behind. And then I just think you had a core group of people that really deeply believed so much that we wouldn't give up. It was like, come hell or high water, we're going to figure this out. Um, and, you know, I think we built this really special software and that's why Northwestern Mutual acquired us for a few hundred million dollars um, to, because they had the same mission and they said, how do we come together and how do we take your software inside our really big company and go do something even more special? And you were there for what, about roughly three and a half years ballpark? Yeah, just about As chief uh, innovation uh, officer. Almost, almost four. Um, yeah. So Can you say just a little bit about that? Because I've got to imagine, and I saw some of it, but that, that was a pretty major transition for you and your team. Yeah. So um, just first, so, uh, you know, dropped out of business school exactly five years after we launched. We got acquired March 25th of 2015. 
I had our first child that weekend. So that was like the most intense week of my life, um, which also like sort of set the stage for parenthood because everything seems easier now. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> she has three children now, by the way. I was like, this is great. <laughs> like if I can live through this one week. Um, uh, and then just again, we, we shared the same value system, which was we really believed in um, giving an American family stability. And the CEO of North Russia Mutual is this amazing guy named John Schlipsky. Uh, and he was like, Alexa, your team is so passionate about empowering Americans. So is ours. What if we teamed up? And it really was just such a beautiful marriage because we built the software and they had uh, a million people and a huge base of 8,000 financial planners. And by coming together, we could do more. Um, but... Uh, Again, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 161-year-old biggest insurance company in, in, in the country. Fast-growing technology tech startup in New York City with 150 people. You put them together, and it's uh, the, the value system was everything, but we couldn't have looked. I mean, it was like the odd couple, if you will. Um, and I was like Gumby in the middle being like, we're all going to be friends. <laughs> we're going to figure this out. Um, and that pretty much is the truth. Um, and I'll just say, uh, I was actually just talking, uh, to the, the, one, one of the leaders, um, chief customer officer over there. And just like our friendship is so real because so much of what we did was, um, business and like merging together mindsets and shifting. And there were times where we had to slow down to be able to help them speed up and, um, it honestly was like an HBS case study on steroids. Um, and in those four years, I think I learned more about myself and the things that I was bad at and needed to get better at to be effective and the things that we were good at and we need to do more of to be effective. Um, and it was just a really humbling experience. And uh, I'll give you a quick example. So I flew to Milwaukee every Monday. Uh, for two days. I mean, we never signed up for that, but that was, you just couldn't lead at some point. I joined the management team. I was the youngest person on the management team by about 25 years. Um, first ever woman uh, to have a child on the management team in 161 years of the company's history. Um, so just breaking rules left and right. Um, and then on the flip side, um, just like such an incredible company because they welcomed our difference of opinions. Um, but I was running about a third of the company uh, and you couldn't do, I couldn't do that from New York. So I had to get on planes and go back and forth and um, we figured it out. And in the end, I'll just say it was an incredible experience. And I think that type of acquisition we'll see more of where big old incumbent titans of industry will acquire the fast moving technology companies um, that make sense to, to bring them inside the fold. Let's talk a little bit about the book. So just curious, you're always on sort of the cutting edge of all things sort of financial planning. And you came off this wildly successful book in 2013, as I mentioned, a New York Times bestseller. You've got a lot going on. What was it that led you right now to know that you had enough that you wanted to write your second book? So just so many things are happening, right? Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, all the way to insure tech and fintech. And there's, a, you know, literally like just left and right devices that you could be using to make your wallet better and Apple Pay and cashless societies. And and I was just like, I really think we need to update the modern guide for your wallet because people are trying to figure out is online safe? You have more security fraud than ever. And I was just like, we really need to have a manual. Um, and so I felt like I at one, I also was like, it needs to be short. It needs to be like about 200 pages so that people can actually get through it quickly. Um, and so I, I decided that's what we needed to do. So the first book was Financially Fearless about how to just better understand your money. Um, this book is Financially Forward. It's really about the future of your wallet and how to um, leverage technology to do more of it for you. So that's why. And what would you say in terms of technology, like playing off that, what are some of the major technology trends that we should be aware of? Like what are, what, what's, what's hot and happening now? Yeah. So the things that get me really excited and I mean, you're all living in the epicenter of the technology future. New York's a great big center, but definitely we, this is the center of tech. Um, there's so many trends. So if you start to think about just the gig economy and the fact that for the first time ever, 40% um, of the country is uh, a freelance worker of some kind where you can monetize any extra hour. My grandfather didn't have that possibility. And so if we think just what that's doing to the future of work and the shift that we're seeing, and 
I almost think we take for granted just the plentifulness of our ability to earn. Um, so my grandfather was like literally a blue collar worker, South Bend, Indiana. He wore an auto mechanic jumpsuit every day. Coolest guy I knew by far um, in my life. And but you know he literally worked at the Studebaker car you know manufacturer for forty years after like you know serving in the army. And then retired at 65 with the pension and like it was simple, but like really one major career and didn't have the benefit of being like, oh, I can like get extra, you know, pay on the weekends or I can do this and that. And today we're going to see young people just fundamentally think differently about careers, which is you don't need one job for 40 years or my husband's dad, right? He was a lawyer for 40 years, same company, 38 years at Cadwallader as a lawyer. Today, we're going to see young people have a job of some kind and then retool their skill sets and probably take six months off and go to Bali and then come, which sounds fabulous, Um, like sign me up Um, and then come back and work again and do something else and then retool again. And maybe that retooling is like learning computer science or learning data science or um, totally going into some other different type of service industry and then getting another job. And if you looked at it visually, again, people used to learn from zero to 25 and then work for 40 years and then retire. We're going to see learning zero to 25. That's not going to change. But you're going to see this middle 40 years begin to look like this much more glorious, sensical way to use and live your life, which is work a bit and enjoy yourself work a bit and enjoy yourself. And sabbatical lifestyles are coming in all the time. We're seeing more and more of those. Um, You're seeing people in the gig economy being able to say, you know what, I'd like to work during these hours only so that I can pick my kids up from school and so I can actually see them and always manage bedtime. And technology has made that possible. Um, So incredible abundance of us just having better lifestyles. Um, And that's really special. Why just wait till retirement, which is really 70, to then enjoy ourselves when you don't know what your health is going to look like. People are looking more like Europe where they're like, let's actually do that now and enjoy it. Um, But we haven't figured a lot about that out. So that poses all types of questions, which is, so then where do you get your health benefits? And how do you think about taxes if you're not a full, uh, you know, if if you're getting hourly wages, who's actually taking your taxes out and protecting you from major tax bills? And so it's just, it's going to inject a lot of questions, um, but it's going to be really, really fascinating. So that's one trend, right? And it's a really interesting one. The other one's a sharing economy that I could talk your ear off, which is we're going to own so much less. And this makes me so happy. (laughs) Um, And now that I, you know, am responsible for a $200 million venture fund, I wish I would have seen this trend faster, but it took me writing the book to really think about it. But um, so right now in each of our homes, we have about 300,000 items. Think about it, literally forks, knives, like your closet, 300,000 items on average in the American family home. Like the Marie Kondo effect, you know, that woman who's like, please bless your stuff and get rid of it. Um, (laughs) Like, you Is it bringing me joy? Yeah, it's bringing, like <laughs> sweatshirt, no longer joy, goodbye. Um, I'm like, all of them, goodbye, like get it out of your house. Um, but that should have been a trend that we should have seen coming um, because we went from a, a bun, like literally own, keep as much as possible to now we're being like, own as little as possible. Rent when you need it. And it you the emergence of the companies that have exploded from ride sharing companies, which um, I'll quickly double click and give you a sense of what that's going to look like. But in five years, you will have a transportation subscription, whether it's Lyft or Uber or a mix of both, where if on a beautiful Friday evening, you're going on a date and you would like a convertible to pick you up and take you on a fun car ride because you want to have the top down and it's grayed out. Uh, to me on the weekend, I now have three kids and I need like a minivan with TVs um, <laughs> because I'm like, please, God, keep everybody like focus for a minute. Um, that's going to be available. And I don't need to own either of those cars. Or if I'm by the beach and I'd like bicycles, bicycles will show up or scooters will show up. And for cheaper than me owning a car, owning for the parking, paying my insurance, paying for all the gas, I will actually get exactly the vehicle when I need it showing up. And that means far more dollars back in my pocket as an American family. That is so cool. And you're actually going to get the best in the minute that you need it. And the same thing now applies for your closet, the rent the runways of the world that are no longer one item, but 
literally a closet in motion at all times. And so that's pretty powerful when you begin to think about what that means for our wallets. Perfect segue, and you started to talk about it anyway, but you're here in San Francisco. There's, you know, an incredibly vibrant startup scene. And when you think of the various trends and things that are interesting, exciting to you, what kinds of things would you mention that are specific to the San Francisco Bay Area? I mean, I just think that the economies that are being birthed right now, that um, the we're beginning to see the foundations of them happening um, are fascinating. So I'll give you another example. Um, the price transparency that we see on the internet is so cool, right? So like you want to buy anything, you can quickly comparison shop, decide what you want, and it shows up. And that's all for the digital space. That's everything that's online. That same sort of price um, uh, ecosystem is going to start to also happen in the physical world. So let's just take the coffee shop that we all maybe get our coffee or our croissant at or whatever in the morning. Um, right now you walk in a place and if you think about it, it's like there's a big chalkboard and it's like cappuccino, three ninety nine, you know, muffins, one ninety nine. That coffee shop has to have the same prices all day long. That makes no sense, right? The internet doesn't do that. The internet is constantly perfecting prices based on traffic and domains and time of day and seasonality, et cetera. And we're going to begin to see that happen in the physical world too. So that coffee shop in the morning, if there's a long line, that coffee maybe costs 10 cents more. And in the evening when they're wanting people to come in, maybe that the prices will go up. And just everything that you begin to see on your online life and your mobile life is also going to enter all your physical life. And I think um, why is because of companies like the PayPals and the Venmos and the Apple Pays and the Stripes of the world that have made those pipes possible. Um, which just means smarter price transparency. And um, the other thing that kind of gets birthed out of that is actually a full new digital marketing ecosystem of, I will pay you on the third day that you walk into your favorite coffee shop and your coffee will be free and on us. That is a far better coupon because you're paying for loyalty right when you want it. And God, isn't it delightful of right when you want your coffee, it's like free, you're like, that is joy, actually. <laughs> um, and that makes sense as a coupon, as opposed to it's Memorial Day and it's 20% off, like, and we hope maybe you show up. Um, and you're just, because the technology exists and because over time your wallet becomes your phone, you start to see just smarter, smarter ways for you to get more money back in your own pocket that actually aligned when you want the money. In your book, you walk through a few hacks for optimizing your dollars. What are a few of your favorites? Um, so I always think, so right now, like literally my mom raised three kids in Jacksonville, Florida. She is still a pediatric nurse practitioner. And I actually have no idea how she did it because she somehow like ironed jeans and like fed us all and made sandwiches, but also still worked and the internet didn't exist. Um, and today I have three kids, uh, which still I have to like keep saying out loud um, because one of them's eight <laughs> weeks old. And so like totally just adjusting to three kids. Um but the fact that you can have things like an Amazon subscription cart where diapers and everything gets delivered to my life. And in the book, I, I literally split how you should think about spending into two major buckets, which is stuff that you need that is super boring and not joyful to spend on. And as a result, you should get as cheap as possible. And that is things literally like toilet paper, paper towels, like basic food that needs to be in your fridge that doesn't bring you any like excitement, but just needs to be there. And then things that you want to spend on. And so where it's fun to think about the trip that you're going on or the vacation or the really good restaurant out or a great piece of clothing that you're excited about or a gift for somebody. Um, and so the biggest hacks are literally leveraging your Instacarts and your Amazon Fresh. So I think about to my mom. My mom had to go for two hours on a Saturday to the grocery store and schlep all the bags and you know put all the food in and absolutely got no price transparency because you went to the local store, which is never better than being online. On Friday night in under two minutes... I, sorry, every Sunday night, literally in under two minutes, I open my, my online cart. I take all my past purchases with my, like literally it's often on the floor of like one of my kids trying to go to sleep and I'm like quickly grocery shopping. In actually two minutes, I can fill an entire grocery cart, hit deliver, and it shows up the next morning. I have not spent two hours at a grocery store. I paid n not a dollar in gas. I've gotten the cheapest items that are the most helpful back in my wallet um, and delivered to my house. And so when I think about that, um, just the power of 
time saving um, is going to be abundant. So some of the hacks are literally how to start separating your shopping. Um, we literally walk through what are the best seasons to buy what items, how to think about the items that bring you like truly no joy, just need to be in your house, um, and how to do them as quickly and as cheaply as possibly. Um, and while writing that, what became really clear to me is that we're trending into this new type of economy, which is actually buying back your time. Um, and so when I was an undergrad, um, uh, I went to Harvard and um, I worked in the happiness lab. Um, and <laughs> It, again, my mom was like, I don't know what degree you're getting, That's but whatever. That's just kind of perfect. Um, like, <laughs> but the one thing that is proven where if you were like, can I buy happiness? Um, we now can prove um, that the answer is yes. Um, and it's when you buy yourself time mm -hmm. back. And particularly when you can offload items that you don't want to do because they're not fun or they're really hard. Um, things like maybe shoveling snow if you live in New England that you absolutely don't love doing. Or for me, I don't love tidying up my house on the weekends when I'd rather be focusing my free minutes like kissing kids, <laughs> um, which is a thing and it gives you a lot of joy. Um, and so for me, I what I think we're starting to shift with is you can actually buy yourself time and it's the one item in life that you can't get more of unless you leverage the service economy and find ways to get rid of items, running errands, schlepping, all of that, and actually put those hours back in your own bank to do the things that you want to do, whether it's meditate, go to the, you know, um, go to a movie, uh, spend time with your kids, whatever it may be. Think, I don't know, be, have peace and quiet. Um, you actually uh, yes. can now <laughs> offload those items. And the flip side of what's so beautiful about this ecosystem is you're probably maybe paying somebody else who needs the money. And it's such a phenomenal world that we're going to live in over the next decade. As a mom of three, one of the things that you talk about in the book is sort of raising digitally native kids. Or you could talk, think about it even as Gen Z. But what, what should people, either their parents or dealing with younger folks, like what's, what's the future look like? What should we be thinking about? Yep. So um, I always like to root any of the advice that we look at in real data and real science just because that was my, my education. And so um, there's this, so first of all, we're moving to a totally digital world. In just the last year, we went from spending 30% cash in the country to 24%. So just dramatically cash. We're moving to a cashless society. It's happening every day. Um, uh, again, as you always shift things, there's winners and losers in it. Um, one of the scary things there is people who like really rely on tips, cash, dollars here and there um, are, are really losing out quickly. Um, and so there's all kinds of digital solutions that are popping up to fix that. Um, but the really big takeaway for our children. So um, my daughter is a Gen A, which is nuts because you it <laughs> I rewinds. haven't heard that term yet. You finish Gen Z and then they start over. So my daughter's, my, my four-year-old's a Gen She's A. She's four. She's four. She's my boss. Um, but she's totally Gen A. And Gen A, what's for sure is cash will not be a thing. Like you will not use cash. Um, and what's really interesting about that is one really powerful thing about cash rooted in like, you know, all of the science and behavioral science is when you part with cash, you're more thoughtful about money. So no surprise here. If you have to part with a $100 bill versus a $5 bill, you are less likely to break 100 You will not spend, if you only had hundreds in your wallet, you spend less than if you had all fives. Um, another really interesting stat is if you were sitting at dinner, and let's say you're eating an awesome pizza meal, and every bite of pizza you had to pay the restaurant, you know, 19 cents or a dollar or whatever the equivalent of that piece of pizza is, guess what? You eat a lot less just a fact. Like no better way to spoil a meal than actually like eating it bite for bite. So what's really powerful is that when you have to par part with things physically, you spend less. But our kids aren't going to have that at all. It's going to be all digital. It's going to be like a bunch of like ones and zeros. And um, the concept of parting with money is going to be very, very different. And as a result, we have to teach them even better um, habits of uh, just savings because at the end of the day, saving is, it's a habit, it's a learned behavior um, because actually they won't have the physicality of it. And so it's just really important to start early. So Punchline, my little uh, four-year-old has six bank accounts and um, we literally save and th there's a big one. It's for college. It's literally this big. Uh, we painted it. Uh, there's high school and the small one is like a cupcake. And sh we're teaching her just the mental behavior um, because it's about delay gratification at its simplest. That's why it, it, it is a behavioral habit. It's not math. What about, and this is going to be less relevant to the 
Gen A's, but safety, security, for those who still have concerns about a cashless society and what that means as yeah. it relates to safety. So I get really excited about the future because um, overnight, uh, right now, the fact that we have wallets and there's all these things in them and money, um, if any, any one of you could go and take my wallet, take my credit card, go across the street, buy yourself a glass of wine, and like maybe in 24 hours, I would be like, oh, somebody has my credit card and you know, I'd have to call and I'd get a new credit card. They'd ship me a new credit card overnight. We'd get rid of the old one. I have to update all my, it's a mess, right? The future is just your phone is your wallet. And Apple Pay, 13% of the country right now uses Apple Pay um, as their primary way of starting to, to pay for things. But at some point, it will just become your phone. That is so cool because what happens is actually your phone has facial recognition. It has your thumbprint. It's actually far more secure uh, in the future. So while, well, yes, as we go online, there's you know different ways that you can actually have issues but we are actually trending towards places where your wallet has far more security because it's much harder to steal a face than it is to just take a credit card out. Unless it's like your Arya Stark in Game of Thrones, like stealing a face is like not that easy. Um, but so I actually get excited about the future because just on the cusp of this awkward transition we're in, as we move to a far more digital wallet, um, it actually gets more secure in the future. Let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin. So I would say probably here and in New York, of course, there's more knowledge about it. But I think there's still a lot of people who are like, what do I have to do? Do I have to play this game? Like, yeah. what does it actually mean? So can you break it down a little bit for us? So I'll just start with the like simple basics, which is um, under like all of the cryptocurrencies, there's really a computer science technology. That's really what matters. Blockchain, um, it is simply uh, a a, a computer science breakthrough that's rooted in cryptography, which is just a bunch of complicated math um, that is outside my pay grade. Um, but the takeaway there is it's very real. And over time, it will actually take hold. So we're far from it taking full hold, but we're starting to see real applications of the technology. The output of that is the cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin happens to be the biggest one. So that's kind of the mini lesson in what's really going on there. Um, for sure, don't run out and like buy Bitcoin, um, which like you could and you could get really lucky. It's currently like, you know, trending upwards. Um, but just in general, I think that's like as speculative as like you, you know, buying any other thing that you're not studying and so not good. Um, and as your friendly financial planner, I would just say don't run out and buy Bitcoin. Um, but what I do think is really interesting and I always like to, um, you know, uh, any advice I give, I like to keep it as simple as, um, could I explain it to my mom in Jacksonville, Florida? Um, but essentially what the technology is doing is very powerful. And um, we are going to live in this future at some point where basically, I think of it, I'm a visual person. So we will each have like our own blockchain parking lots. I think of the whole world as a big parking lot. Um, and like, you'll have your own blockchain parking lot and I'll have my own blockchain parking <laughs> lot. And everything I own will be in my blockchain parking lot and everything you own will be in yours. And we will just be able to seamlessly pass value of any kind, money, real estate, um, other types of loans, um, very seamlessly. And it will cut out so many abundant middlemen, so many. Um, and that actually, again, also means more money back in our pockets. Because even if I was going to Venmo you $20, I have my bank account involved. You have a bank account involved. So maybe it's JP Morgan Chase, maybe yours, Merrill. And then there's Venmo, which is PayPal in the between. So it's three different people for me to give you $20 securely. But in our future, my parking lot's secure, your parking lot's secure, and I can literally just throw you 20 bucks and there's no fees. So you're cutting out tremendous middlemen. Um, and it just begins to create a really powerful future. Um, the other thing I'll say that's really neat about digital currencies is Right now, we just live in a world where it's two decimal places. So, you know, there's 99 cents, there's a penny, two decimal places. The future crypto world goes to eight decimal places. And that is just a really powerful shift that creates a micro economy that we can't even like fully comprehend what it will do to us. But to give an example, it's, it's going to open up business models that you never could think about before. So, for example, I read the New York Times or, you know, the information, other subscriptions, and those you pay, let's say, $10 a month. In the future, you'll be able to pay down to a 
tenth of a penny or per article. And that opens up overnight a micro economy that's very powerful. Thank you. <coughs> You're welcome. Start thinking just a little bit about questions you might have. I'm going to move away from the book for a minute, but I have a strong sense we're going to come back to it. So be thinking about your questions. <coughs> but I want to talk to Alexa just a little bit about her next chapter, because I think forever long, we all know Alexa, there's always going to be sort of the next new thing that she's onto. And she sort of briefly mentioned it, but she's just founded a new venture capital firm called Inspired Capital. Uh, two quick questions, really, but one is why and what? So what is it and why are you doing it? Um, so as I was thinking just as authentically as I could about what do I want to do next in life. Um, and I kind of went, uh, my husband is a wonderful partner to me and um, had lots of different job opportunities. And he said, don't be reactive, be proactive. What do you want to do? And I started realizing with all my free time, I was coaching entrepreneurs, sitting with entrepreneurs, thinking about the future. I kind of love obsessively thinking about the future. I think it's a really fun thing. Um, and I overnight just was like, I should do what I'm doing in my free time, which is advising entrepreneurs and investing in entrepreneurs. Um, and then one day, literally, I said, you know, it's just inspired capital. And then I was Such like, a great name. And I was like, is that name taken? And it wasn't. Um, we had to pay $6,000 for it. So it was taken, <laughs> but we made it not. Um, and I literally just it was it was like, that. Um, it took me uh, a few months of just soul searching and it just one day clicked. Um, and the entire uh, ethos of our venture fund is it's a, a $200 million fund uh, headquarters in New York City, where there's uh, an abundant ecosystem that's being stood up and evolving. Um, and our whole DNA is uh, one of the other uh, co-founders is this amazing woman, Penny Pritzker, who is Obama's Secretary of Commerce and a phenomenal entrepreneur herself. Um, uh, one of the other uh, partners uh, was one of the co-founders of Paperless Post. I'm sure you've all gotten many Paperless Posts before. Um, and we said we want to bring together a team of just really, really passionate entrepreneurs who can think about the next wave of innovation and entrepreneurs. And um, at 35, we joke that we're kind of cool enough to still like be relevant to a 22 year old, but also like live through a recession. So we also know how to be adults and um, think about the future. And so that's what we're doing at Inspired Capital. And it's just so we're 90 days up. Um, it's brand new. And it's been so much fun. I mean, congratulations. Once again, Force of Nature raised a $200 million fund like basically overnight. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And you kind of talked about it, but I think one of the things that's interesting about it is it's you use the term builders. So coming back to you know everybody who's involved and going to be making those investments is going to be speaking at it from a kind of entrepreneur, entrepreneurial perspective. Yeah. Can you say, and I don't know how much you can and can. want to talk about the fund, so I won't no, no, too I will. deeply, no, no, I but... Will. Um, we kind of really believe we're building a new species of a venture fund, which is like the the future fund um, that we, we are internally calling a builder's fund. Um, and what we mean by that is um, when I think back to Learn Best and there were, you know, companies are never built like this, right? They're like this. Um, some days it's like this and then you turn it around. Um, but my absolute best mentors, advisors um, were actually people who had built and sold and scaled companies that just had this empathy because they knew the weight of the world is on your shoulders um, and they know how to care, but also they know how to cut through the noise really quickly. I had one board member who'd be like, we've talked about this for too long. And I'd be like, but we talked about it for three minutes. And he'd be like, too long, make a decision and move on. And I'd be like, you're saying it with love, but it's been three minutes. Um, and so I realized that the, those were the best people. And again, I kind of stepped back and I said, if you're going to climb Kilimanjaro, the best way to do it is to ask the person who just did it and say, How'd you train? How'd you pack? What'd you take with you? Who'd you take with you? What seasons you go in? And any other advice I know before I go. And that is exactly what our venture fund is, is people who have done just that very, very recently to help advise entrepreneurs. Um, and it's just a blast, honestly. It's like I'm having the most fun I've had in a really long time. Do you know yet what general areas you'll be investing in? Early stage consumer tech, seed, series A, uh, and uh all shapes and sizes. So um, consumer, uh, direct to consumer enterprise, and uh, we'll do B2B, um, but all categories. So there's not anything that's off limits. Um, and we just want to see really passionate entrepreneurs um, that are going after big marketplaces where there's a real technology angle too. So I'll say, um, you know, we, we do care about the technology backbone. 
by the way, just kind of particularly cool too that the three first investors are all women too, which is just unique and special. Yeah. We are not a female <laughs> focused fund. We just happen to have some great females. Uh, Most which qualified. We have, we have uh, f- uh, four partners, um, one man, and he joked that he's the diversity, um, which is like so funny and so true because uh, we weren't trying to build a team of women, but we just happen to be women. Congratulations. So, thank you. I want to make sure and open it for questions. I know we've got some mics around the room. I'm sure people have lots of questions for Alexa. Of all shapes and sizes. We have one right here. I can repeat the question. I don't know that you need mics. Um, you're so inspired. And you have so many great ideas. Inspired. I know. <laughs> Um, so actually, uh, quick stat. So 84% of the country does not get educated on financial literacy. Um, that is a brand new stat. I think California gets six hours by the time you hit 12th grade. And literally last week, Harvard just introduced it. I think 400 people sent me the article. Um, I was like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yep, got it. Thank you. Still getting it. Thank you. Um, it's just a massive problem. Massive. And my first book I wrote because I was like, this is perfect. Colleges can get it. It can go in every college. Basically, it's a shorter, fresher textbook. Um, then I realized colleges don't have budgets. And um, it's a huge issue. And and it's too, and by the time that you're in college, it's really late because you've also already racked up $4,000 of student debt on average of credit card debt. By the time every college senior, so there's 1.8 million college seniors who graduate every year, they make about $30,000. They graduate with about $4,000 of credit card debt and with about $30,000 of student loans. That is the average. So they come out upside down at college. That's the future of our country. And so um, just, I, I've like talked to him blue in the face. I couldn't be more passionate about it. Uh, I have gone to Washington twice um, to try to figure out how do we come up with some policy um, and we have to fix it. And I now just believe that the private sector startups technology is the best angle to go. So, but one great question. Over there. Just go a ahead. sec, I'm gonna walk over. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Oh, there you go. Just wondering, um, when is it time to move past a book and with a financial planner? So, I mean, those companies exist, those people exist. When do you move past an educating book and to somebody you trust? So I think that uh, um, everybody uh, should work with a financial planner. Uh, first of all, the book's a great start, um, but I, it's just like a, a, a tr- anything else in your life. If you have somebody standing next to you when you're on the treadmill, you run a little faster, you do a bit more. And really, it's accountability. Um, and I be- I'm a certified financial planner, so CFP. In a perfect world, everybody would work with the CFP um, because it really means you're trained and you're also you have a fiduciary responsibility which I like. Um, But so I think everybody, especially by the time that you pair up and you get married and you're a partner, having a third party is super important to also just, um, it is a bit of therapy. It's it's getting the whole household aligned. Um, And even my husband and I, we have somebody we work with. Um, I mean, I joke that I just tell that person what to tell him. Um, (laughs) It's very, um, and it's very productive. Um, But um, it's super important because it's never about the money. It's about all the other things that are there. It's the people, it's the decisions. Do you help your parents before you help your child? What does that look like? And money's hard for everybody. Not a single human in this room feels perfect about money. I, I mean, it's the one thing I'm certain on. So, Lexa, just to follow on to that, like, should everybody have a CFP? Um, everybody should have a CFP. Uh, and uh, again, one of the things I'm really proud of is just that w- the business models are starting to exist. Um, but let's just put it this way. It makes no sense that once you finally have a ton of money, you can then get access to a financial advisor. Financial planning should not be a luxury product. It's like doctors. Imagine the same concept that once you get really sick, then you can get access to a doctor. Like that makes no sense. Um, And as a result, I always said financial planning should never be a luxury product. It should be a mass market product that everybody gets access to so that you can stay healthy. Thank you. Okay, so I love that you're so optimistic about the future of technology, but 
there's already such tremendous wealth disparity in this country. And there's already a lot of people who are being left behind by the technology and the transformation towards gig economies. How do you see that working out? Are people going to have retirement and maternity leave if they're not fully employed, if they don't have a pension? Like, how is that going to kind of flush out? Um, So I think, first of all, this is something I'm super passionate about, which is the income inequality. There's this great video, if you haven't already seen it, just Google income inequality in America, um, HBS video. And it like walks through all the math and just the punchline is there's a massive disparity and it's unfortunately getting worse. Um, So I don't think that that problem is being solved. Um, And I think that just like anything else, I'll give you an example with autonomous vehicles, 22 million um, uh, bus drivers or uh, sorry, truck drivers overnight lose jobs. Um, and how do we absorb that into um, our economy and how do we you know, help those people not be left behind? Um, we don't have a perfect solution for. But if you actually, what gives me a lot of hope is if you rewind hundreds of years and do this over and over, I just went through this really cool program at the Aspen Institute called the Henry Crown Fellowship where you actually have to study hundreds of years of history and the problems that we've had to solve as society. And the headline is, We've seen this movie before, Industrial Revolution, many different types of advancements of technology, and the, the haves and have-nots people get left behind. <coughs> the, the answer is we're moving faster than ever. So um, the, the rapid change of technologies, we're going through m- more of those cycles faster. So we've seen this movie before, but we're just going to go through more of them faster than we ever have. And what I love about the future of money is actually it digitizing allows us to help people faster. So universal basic income. That actually becomes very possible when you think about blockchain and you ask people, would you be willing to give an eighth of a penny to somebody who desperately needs it to make sure we have stability and people not living on the streets? Pretty much any human you'd ask in this room would be like an eighth of a penny, happy to do it, done. To help somebody be taken care of? Absolutely, because we're gonna have safer cars on the road, which is gonna mean fewer, fewer lives lost. We would do that. I think as a society, we would do that in a heartbeat. Those are the sort of advancements I get excited about. So it is a double-edged sword, which is we're going to rapidly move. There'll be tons of millions of people that are displaced. But at the same time, the technology is starting to catch up where we'll have good solutions to that. All that said, the flip side of any technology is there will be darkness too, right? You will have to be more thoughtful about cybersecurity. So there's a whole section of my book on literally how do you get ahead of that and what are the things in that the punchline is there's an online hygiene that we all need to have and you need to follow it. Um, but so uh, that is my answer, which is I do think the future gets brighter. I do. Can you say just a little bit more about online hygiene? What do you yeah. mean by that? Um, I just came up with that. It's in the book. But, um, <laughs> I was going to say, I think it's in the book. Yeah, it's in the book. But um, so it's just some basics, which is like, First of all, uh, it's 2019. The internet's here to stay. Um, You should have all of your banks online. Um, You should log into them regularly, if not daily. We call it a daily money minute, which is, you know, first of all, fewer accounts is better. Um, So, you know, I sit here and I do not have more than five accounts. Five. Um, So it's really easy for me if I get paper mail from one of the banks I don't have to know something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, I also check all five of them every day. It takes seconds. Literally, I'm like, I just quickly log in. Does everything look normal? Um, so those sort of things where, um, and again, it's easy to do if you don't have 22 accounts. Um, so that's one. Another thing is just things around your security. So checking your credit karma uh, once every single, uh, again, you can do it once a month. It's really easy. It takes t- seconds. Um, but just to make sure, you know, is anything going wrong? Uh, but then also we go through, uh, online privacy around passwords. So just simplest answer for this, just to make everybody um, smarter about online passwords. So the issue of when you get data breaches is like, let's say Target was hacked. What happens is people who want to take advantage of your online privacy, wait for like three years and maybe they'll get 100,000 email addresses with 100,000 passwords and they'll sit on them. And then they'll wait four years later and they'll go to a different type of account that they'll hack. Let's just say if it's Target the first time, maybe it's Kohl's the second time. And they'll download them all onto the Kohl's website. And at some point, because lots of people use the same email password, the same email address with the same password, 
some version of those will actually go in and they'll be able to get access to your credit card. That's how it works. That's typically what the violations look like. So the answer is don't use the same email address and password for all of your things, um, which we do. Um, and so the good e- example is to use, you know, Alexa at Gmail and then each website you use, use Amazon Alexa one, two, three. And then if I'm on, you know, Whole Foods, maybe it's Whole Foods Alexa one, two, three. So there's all these different tricks of how you can have simpler passwords to remember, but actually they're not the exact same so that if that type of um, privacy hack happens, you're ne- you actually know that you will not be um, subject to it. So again, more hygiene in the book. There's a whole list of exactly the rules to follow. I kept it plain English and super simple. So I love these questions, all shapes and sizes. Start up, go for it. Go ahead. Actually, sorry. Hold, I feel one. Well, sorry. Thank you. Um, you talked a lot about price transparency and how in the future we're going to be able to like see this in physical stores and not just digital. How do you advise companies to create brand loyalty if you're always going to look for like the lowest price? And even you said today, like you go on your app and you pick like the lowest price toilet paper. And before maybe people really loved Charmin or like <laughs> certain type of toilet paper. And now I feel like younger generations aren't going to feel that brand loyalty. I mean, I do think that it's now, um, first of all, the product that you buy has to be quality. I think that always will matter, but it's everything around it. It's what comes with that product. It's the service. It's the, you better understand my data needs. You, you as a company, you know, what I love about Amazon is um, I'll log in and they're like, you need paper towels. And I'm like, I do. And you know that. (laughs) And I don't want to think about it. So thank you. Yes, ship them, one click. Um, Those are the sort of things that I think um, it is actually about giving people time back. Um, So I do think that's going to be a huge trend of the future is giving people time back. And do you think the brand loyalty thing will be less prevalent? Like you think of out here, there's a company called Brandless, right? Yeah. Sharky's company. Yeah. It feels like there's at least some... In certain cases, yes, but in other cases, no. Um, So let's take the food category. Um, So on my podcast the other day, I interviewed the CEO of Sweetgreen, and the the, um, piece is going to come out really soon. Um, The future of food is super exciting, which is we all have our food that we love. Like, you know it. Like, you have your three or four restaurants where you're like, God, that one dish is my favorite. The future of food is that you're going to be able to get the exact brand that you love and the exact dish that you love because it's a recipe. So it actually, by nature, you love the brand because they have a recipe that they're giving you. And overnight, in the same way that transportation has become fluid and you can get on you know, uh, any type of transportation in seconds, it picks you up. Um, think about that for one second. So back when the internet was born, which was, call it 2000, um, Uber and all the you know driverless cars or sorry, um, uh, ride sharing cars, you know, popped up really only about 10 years ago. Now they're public, but we all use them. And they've changed our consumer behavior so much. So just think about it. My entire life, I'm pretty sure my parents drilled into my head, never get in a car with a stranger ever. Like literally that was the rule, right? Yep. And now we do it. And it's like totally normal. You're like, I just get in anybody's car and I just go places. Um, same thing with Airbnb. It's like, I'm again, same rule. Do not sleep in people's beds <laughs> that you don't know. That was like a rule. It's still a rule. It's a rule for my child too. Airbnb, we do it. Just think about that. We could have never guessed that that was being born out of the internet. Just that fluidity of, of anything. Um, the same thing's going to happen to food. And so we are going to be more obsessed with food brands. And uh, Jonathan Newman, who I just interviewed, um, talked about how um, because the transportation is there, you will be able to get your exact favorite meal and the concept of a family all having to eat the same food will go away. Maybe one child has really specific food needs and it's gluten-free, but the other child can't eat gluten and that's totally okay. So overnight for the exact same price, you'll have the exact meal that everybody wants to eat delivered at the right time and mom or dad didn't have to cook it and you actually spent less money. And so that is really powerful to the future of food and you'll actually know all the ingredients and you'll have it perfectly healthily. And that's awesome. So I think in some cases, brands will win. In other cases, maybe they don't because you don't care. And again, I don't quite care what my paper towels are, just as long as they're there and I didn't have to think about them. Oh. Thank you. Um, Well, uh, it is a really interesting session. Thank you. Uh, 
you mentioned about businesses going down down the hill and then going up down the hill. What do you recommend when it's going really down the hill, preventing a heart attack? <laughs> a heart attack. Right. I mean, if I had that answer. That's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly just about a month ago, an associate of mine experienced. Yeah. They had the business established. They had salespeople going. And then sales, the engineers were not able to provide the services that they were committed yeah. So then for... I mean, say, yeah. yeah, start, I'll just say, uh, you know, so I once heard this quote, I think I was like three years into starting LearnVest and, you know, I'd already invested my savings and pretty much my full life at that point. Um, and someone who was a far more successful entrepreneur than me said to me, if you knew what it takes to start a company, you would never do it. Um, because like the deeper you get in, the deeper you realize that you're like, oh, it's way harder than people think. Um, it is incredibly hard. Um, I think that's what makes it so fulfilling and also what makes it, you know, the the potential outcome can be super successful. Um, but it is not made for the faint of heart. Um, and somebody who worked with me, she was this phenomenal um, uh, 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 woman I worked with who um, I was so blessed to work with. She was super talented. Um, she once said, Alexa, people ask me every day what it's like to work with you. And of course, I'm like, what is it like to work with me? <laughs> and she's like, you get punched in the face every day and you don't even know it. And I'm like, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? And I'm like, but she, she was just like, you constantly are dealing with some huge negative X, Y, Z, and you just have to be made for it. And sometimes, you know, as I'm interviewing entrepreneurs, what is constantly being asked in the back of my head is how resilient is this person? Can somebody tell you no 10 times and it doesn't hurt your feelings and you get right back up. And at some point, literally my associate, somebody who worked with me said, you get punched in the face and you don't even notice. And I'm like, does that make me a robot? Like, what am I? <laughs> um, but so the answer is, if if you're wired to every time somebody tells you you suck or that somebody pulls a deal on you or somebody quits on you, that was the thing I always took the mo the hardest was when somebody quits on you, yep. who you need and who, or who you love. That's way harder. Um, and it breaks your heart, but you have to keep going and you have to just get right back in the ring. So my favorite quote is the Teddy Roosevelt quote of the you know man or woman in the arena, which is like, once you've been in the ring and you know how hard it is, I never criticize another entrepreneur because I have so much empathy. Like I know the hardships. I know the bravery of putting yourself out there and being uh, an entrepreneur. And um, that's why I always love to root for people. My recommendation is to make sure you have safety net that's why you need a financial plan. <laughs> Perfect segue. Uh, Read the is, book. <laughs> this is going to be our last audience question. Okay. Pressure. Hi. Um, I heard you talk about two things um, that I want to ask about. The first is the role of services as, you know, the excitement of being able to farm out a lot of the tasks we don't want to do and have someone provide that service. Obviously, there's a lot of ways the services can be provided. Um, you're talking about Amazon reminding you of all the things. We have Alexa to remind us of all the things, I'm sure. <laughs> um, Echo in my house. But so there's, there is that brand loyalty. Um, and there's also someone that has to then provide the service as well. There's the back end of it. There's the people filling the orders at Amazon, et cetera. The second phenomenon is the walled garden. So if Uber is able to start having minibuses, have cars at different levels, have bikes and scooters, and I become a subscriber, then I'm only provided, provided by their services and not all the other opportunities to have micromobility. What is the role of regulation in those two frequencies or occurrences that you see that to, to make things more fair? Um, so... Uh, a few things. First of all, reg regulatory environments, um, in certain cases, like need to lock down and fully protect the consumer, right? But then another case, so let's take financial planning. Um, you know, financial planning is very slow. The regulatory environments are incredibly onerous because they want to make sure nobody is taking advantage of somebody who could come and manipulate an everyday mom and pop and, and you know, take their money away. But on the flip side, it's extremely extremely onerous. Like, you know, at LearnVest, literally in marketing, we couldn't put up an ad that's just like, we're here to help you with your money. And Sarah loved our service. We no use of testimonials. 
that is like far too burdensome, right? In general, the regulatory environment follows the innovation. Um, so I would just say the role of the regulatory environment is to keep up. Um, and where it really matters to protect somebody, to protect somebody, but also to get the heck out of the way of innovation that can maybe bring um, uh, better improvement to communities. So the answer is, unfortunately, the regulatory environment will always be behind. Um, it needs to be really heavy-handed in places where the protections are vital, but heavy-handed everywhere does not make sense. Um, and I think that it can slow or curb innovation, um, and that's not great either. So unfortunately, the regulatory environment is not as well-funded as the innovation, um, and so as a result, will always lag. So, Thank you so much, Alexa. I know that we could go on for hours, but you're so inspiring and so passionate, and we're so excited to see all the things that you do in the future. And just so that everyone here knows, Alexa pre-signed a lot of books beforehand, so please make sure to pick those up on the way out. And Crystal, I don't know, was there anything else we needed to... Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. The one th Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. Apparently, every time a speaker speaks here, they're asked the last question. So that wasn't actually the last question. This is the last question. Your 60-second idea for how to change the world. Um, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> we did tell her in advance that this question was coming. <laughs> they told me like four minutes before we sat down. Yeah. And I was like, the 60-second idea that changes the entire world. <laughs> Got it. Um, uh, so actually, I do have an answer to this one, which is um, here is a really big idea. When our phones become our wallets um, and they become a bank overnight, here's what happens. So right now, most of the planet actually owns a phone, um, literally regardless of where you live, whether you live in sub-Saharan Africa or you live in like London, you own a phone. Um, when overnight your phone becomes your entire financial world, it becomes your bank, it becomes your institutions, it's all right there at your fingertips. Um, 40 countries in the entire planet have access to safe savings. So think about it. We all save without any thought. You're like, I want to save. Maybe it goes in a 401k. Maybe it goes in an IRA. Maybe it goes in an emergency savings account. We save. At the root of saving is actually you protecting somebody because what you can do is if, God forbid, something happens, we have a plan B. That's what savings really is at its core. Most of the planet does not have access to safe savings. Most communities literally cannot look their other family members in the eye and say, if you X, Y, and Z happens tomorrow, I don't have money for you outside, but they physically have maybe on their bodies or in their beings or in their home. So if you can overnight give the entire planet safe savings, the amount of abundance you can create, the first time you could actually deploy something like a universal or a global minimum wage, overnight, you could stabilize the planet financially. That is a very big idea. And it is one that brings me incredible joy that I hope in my lifetime over the next 30, 40 years, um, I can be a part of helping us see through, but you could actually stabilize families because at its core, savings stabilizes families. It gives people the ability to make choices on other things. It gives people the ability to avoid um, imminent danger. It's really, really powerful. So beautifully well done. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you guys for having me.